Welcome to the Carbide Port Show. This is our fifth episode of the webinar. Uh, we like to do these every other week. We post a link to this webinar for a live meeting uh, over on our community forums. So you can find it there by you know either Kevin or Will or Josh, um, but we will post these you know regularly. So you can always meet us for a 3 p.m. live session or we all post these to YouTube afterwards. So if you can't catch it, we'll always have that available for later viewing. But hey, my name is Fleming. I do support for Carbide 3D. So chances are maybe we have spoken already, but it's nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, trying to think of what to talk about this week and kind of stemmed from a lot of new machine users and what you've seen you know, in the last few weeks of new Shipoko 5 users or, or what have you. Um, and a big thing has been setting zero, understanding zeros. What is an offset, your work offset? What is the machine zero and you know so on and so forth. Um, so I kind of wanted to break that down just a little bit to give a, a better understanding of why we set work zeros, what it means to clear your offsets, what it means to set a zero, how to return and double check things. Um, so we're going to kind of start there today. What is a machine zero? So uh, your machine, when you first connect it to Carbide Motion, we often, you know, we recommend, we require you send the settings. So that helps your machine specify what kind of shape POCO it is, what direction it needs to move. Um, after we do all that and, you know, those first steps we need to initialize, uh, what it's doing in that process, it's, you know, you've probably seen it hits each limit switch and it goes to that back right corner. Uh, that back right corner is going to be your machine's zero. That's the machine zero always. That's going to be its zero, zero, zero location. Um, in homing, it's trying to find a constant position in the back to then create and understand where it kind of lives, you know, in the machine assembly. So that's how we're able to use the bit setter because, you know, from that homing zero, position, it knows that the bit setter has a constant position of, you know, 855 millimeters on Y and negative five millimeters on X or, you know, so on and so forth. So homing is incredibly important, especially with, you know, new features and accessories that we kind of have out in the, in the world that require a constant zero or like a repeatable, you know, place, you know, what is different than the machine zero is going to be our work offset or our work zero. Um, in Carbide Create, you define this by, you know, where's my zero position? So that's typically in the lower left-hand corner. Um, you know, you can change that to a couple different settings within our software, depending on, you know, that specific project. Um, but in reference to the machine zero, your work zero is wherever you've specified on your design where you're going to say, hey, from this point, my project then lives in this space. So when we kind of do that in practice, we have our piece of material on our machine. We have specified in this case, the lower left-hand corner is zero. The machine will home. It now has an idea of where it lives in space. That's when we go to the jog menu. We jog the cutter all the way over to the material. Um, we jog the Z all the way down. And then where the machine is sitting now, in relation to the work zero is where our project lives in space. It's a weird one to wrap your head around. I think the big takeaway from here is the machine will always home. It'll always know its position from that, you know, where it's homing from. And then when we set a zero for our job, we want to make sure that we're just telling the machine, hey, based on our design, this is exactly where I'm expecting you to reference. Not where it's going to start. That's I'll take that with a grain of salt. Depends on how you're setting your zero and what kind of zero you're setting. Sometimes you can go for a center zero if you're trying to, you know, line up something to a middle of a piece, or if it's more strategic. But you'll kind of figure that out with more experimentation. Um, let's see. So why I bring all this up is a lot of questions that we get are confusion when it comes to well, do I clear all offsets? Do I zero all? What's happening there? Um, and to kind of explain that a little bit better, clearing all offsets is essentially clearing any work zero that we have set. So it has nothing to do with, you know, the home zero in the back right corner, but the work zero will be wiped away. So what you can do in times of, you know, oh, well, hmm, 
I don't know if I set X where I wanted it to or Y. I kind of want to just start over. You can keep your cutter in the same position and you can just clear all offsets. That way it's kind of you know easy to think, okay, my machine is holding on or carbide motion is holding on to no work zero. I can go ahead and zero all or you know zero X, Y, or Z from this position. And I know for a fact that at this point, this is where it considers my work offset to be. Um, now, granted, when you zero all, it's essentially wiping any previously set offset and setting where your cutter currently is sitting as the current zero. So it's a little tricky. They both essentially do the same thing, but not. Clearing all offsets just wipes any previously set zero. Zero all or setting a new zero does the same, but also replaces that previous work offset with our new zero point. Again, this comes with time and a little bit of practice. Um, one thing that I did want to show you that is just interesting, I don't really think, you know, again, you probably won't get hung up on this too much um, as you're kind of learning. Okay, so one thing I really wanted to point out here, uh, it's something that you might stumble upon if you're just clicking around in carbide motion, um, but over on the left-hand side, there is machine position and there is position. So machine position will kind of show you where you are in relation to that, you know, machine zero, the back right corner, and then there's position of where you're in space just with your cutter. Um, I, you can you know pay attention to, to this portion of your screen when you're setting zeros. Uh, when you're on that just position screen, if you set a zero, it should then wipe out any coordinate there and show you zero, 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 if you zero all. Granted, you know if you zero just one axis, it'll show you zero, but that idea is the same. Um, so it's kind of helpful. There will be times where, let's say, you know, I, I'm pretty certain that my zero is on, but as I jog to where I thought I set it, I look over, my coordinates are not showing zero. It's still showing like 20 and Y or something. It, it's just an easy way to check your workflow if, you know, you're superstitious about things not going correctly. Um, another thing that I wanted to kind of touch on here when it comes to... Uh, how to check your zeros in general. These two buttons have saved me time and time again, and I promise you they will save you as well. So from this screen on the right-hand side, you have a couple other options other than just the various points on the machine, which you could rapid to. Um, you have rapid to current XY, which will rapid position your cutter back to the last known or last set XY zero in carbide motion. This is incredibly helpful. Um, there have been so many times where, you know, I need to restart a file. I need to change a Z zero or make a, you know, small adjustments. Um, I can stop my current job. I can wrap it back and, you know, I can trust the fact that it will be there. Um, I was talking to Kevin recently and I've been in this situation as well, where, you know, he was machining something, the, had a failure of some sort, it crashed or, you know, bit came loose, something went wrong. However, carbide motion held on to that zero. So he power cycled the machine, came back to it, wrapped it back with a new tool, could double check his you know, work coordinates and he was good to go. So again, having that in the back of your mind and and using that as like, you know, a, a source of reference is so helpful. <laughs> so many times you kind of get a little superstitious that things aren't gonna go well. Uh, another thing that you wanna get in the habit of is clicking on rapid to current Z plus six millimeter. Um, that'll give you a six millimeter gap from you know the top of your material, but Z will come all the way down. And again, you can eyeball that reference. Um, six mil is a pretty small gap, but you can then exit out of this rapid position screen by clicking on done, change your increment values to one millimeter and quite literally jog all the way down. Because again, there's no harm or, you know, there's nothing wrong with checking your zero multiple times. Learning with a bit zero, bit zero is super handy, but it does all the work for you. So once you have probed uh, using the corner, you know, probe option with the bit zero, you don't have to do anything else. You can remove your magnet, move the bit zero away, make sure the magnet's not touching the body, and then you can run your file, um, you know, without issue. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention too, uh, there's, you know, again, the bit setter can be one to struggle with in terms of just operation and, and workflow. Uh, if you're unsure about your tool height, click on load new tool. You can always load new tool before running a job. It will help reset the current tool height to that initial homing tool height measurement and will just be, you know, again, 
another one of those fail safe methods to make sure that you're aligned with where you expect to be. Good question. So to toggle between machine position and position, um, this was the question. It was super simple to kind of stumble upon it, but hard to make it happen again. Basically, when you hover over the words machine position or position, you can just click and it'll change between the two. So again, it was one of those things I think I discovered on accident and was like, what is this? And then, you know, again, with more time, it made more sense. But yeah, if you ever are curious, click on position, machine position, and it'll toggle. Well, we will go ahead and I guess move on to our next topic. How fast can my machine go? I want my machine to go as fast as humanly possible. And, you know, oh, my machine can't cut it, you know, 300 inches per minute. This is ridiculous. Um, and I think there's a bit of a myth when it comes to speed and efficiency. So I kind of wanted to talk about why fast isn't always efficient and kind of start there. So speed. I Moving laterally through the material faster, yes, will essentially get you a faster, you know, machining process or a faster cut. Yet, increasing your speed can produce more chatter in your tool. It can produce, you know, worse cut quality when it comes to tight corners. It can, it, it, essentially, it can have an adverse effect on your cut potentially making it, you know, more post-processing for you in the long run. So, you know, we can attack our material as fast as humanly possible, you know, and, and try to essentially get the fastest speed out of the material or the machine. But a lot of that, you know, cleanup time is spent sanding or, you know, trying our project again because our measurements were off or, you know, things of that nature. Um, so a thing that, you know, we often see is I want to go over 200 inches per minute. I should be able to go faster. And again, factoring in all that time of cleanup or, you know, troubleshooting a cut that's gone wrong because cutting forces were too much or something slipped or, you know, the material broke away from you. Cutting efficiently and strategizing your cuts in a way that is going to, uh, you know, uh, attack your design well, um, organizing your tool path so that there's not, you know, a million tool changes that, you know, it could have been done a different way. Um, little things like your retract hide and, and ordering your parts in a closeness that makes it so we can pocket certain sections. There's a lot of things that we can do to essentially get a faster cut and a faster process, um, but kind of still retain that cut quality and ensure that, you know, what we're cutting is of, like I said, uh, clean lines and, and good walls and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the first thing is kind of looking at your design. And in Carbide Create, there's a lot of things that you can do to speed up, you know, a specific project. Um, namely, the first thing is kind of in our settings screen. Uh, there is a setting towards the bottom that goes over retract height. Retract height is the height of which your cutter will go above the zero that you'd set previously. It'll move over to the next, it'll wrap it over to the next point if it's going to plunge, and that's where it's going to plunge. Um, so it's that height of going above your zero and then, you know, going back into the material. Um, the higher that that is set to, you know, if you go half an inch above the material every time you need to lift up and go to an another section of that material, it's going to take a lot longer than if we went up an eighth of an inch. Granted, sometimes we may need to avoid special clamping if you know we have a very specific setup for a job. So we may not always be able to try to keep that as low as possible, but experiment with it. Often on my Nomad, I find that, you know, I'm using really small tools with really small, you know, fine material. I honestly keep most of my retract height for like milling brass, for example, down to 0 0.05 inches. It, it only needs to move up above, move over to the next and cut it. Um, so again, that helps me speed up my process, especially in metals that, you know, take a little bit more time to cut in general. Um, there's also, you know, ways that you can essentially drag and reorganize your tool path so that, you know, we don't go from a 201 to a 102 back to a 201 and kind of have that same dance over and over again. Uh, Granted, if you're doing a contour cut and a big pocket and then some fine detail, you want to make sure you cut out 
your project from the material at the very end. <laughs> there are certain things that you cannot compromise on, but you know, a lot of this comes with experimentation. Um, sometimes I find that, you know, if I'm batching three parts of the same, you know, piece, just in the way that I organize how they fit together, I can create certain pockets to get everything down to almost tab height. And then my contour tool path is really fast. Um, you know, there's uh, a fantastic new feature in Carbide Create Pro called rest machining, um, which, you know, makes the process even better. I don't, if you haven't played with rest machining, I definitely, you know, um, suggest doing so. You, uh, so rest machining works in terms of pocketing. Basically, let's say I've got a huge pocket with really fine details all in the corners and, you know, in tough places, places to reach. Uh, the 201 can do a majority of that, probably won't get into all those little nooks and crannies. So with rest machining, I can add a duplicate pocket with a much smaller tool. I can let the software know that I've, you know, already pocketed most of that with the 201. And then, you know, in a matter of a few minutes, it'll go and get all of the extras. It'll go in and get all the, all the spaces that the original tool diameter couldn't fit into. And again, takes what once would have been, I don't know, again, this is a theoretical project, but it, it, I've seen times go from like an hour down to, you know, 22 minutes just because we were able to change those things a little bit better. Granted, you know, play around with tool paths. You can add an offset to create another outline to get, you know, certain sections. There's a lot you can do with Carbide Create and just experimentation. I think ultimately, a lot of, you know, what makes it kind of fun is experimenting with your material, with your cutters, with different ways to cut things. You always kind of surprise yourself there. Um, let's see here. Another thing I kind of want to touch on, which is an interesting thought. Um, a lot of the times that, you know, we see support issues in regards to, you know, batching parts, it, it's always, you know, a sad side. You see someone with a full sheet of material, they've cut like 40 of the same part, they almost all look beautiful. And then, you know, maybe three lines in, there started to be a malfunction. So now half of the sheet is, you know, totally gone, can't use it any longer, whatever. So, and that kind of brings up the trouble of machining so many parts at once. The idea there is that I'm knocking them all at the same time. It should be faster, but you know, in terms of post-processing and maybe getting off or drifting in one axis because we, you know, program it to go a little too far, it it can be more time consuming in the long run. Um, I've, you know, talked to those that essentially went from machining as many parts as possible in one go to, you know, doing just a small set, but doing it well and optimizing that tool path over time pushing it a little faster, adjusting the feed and speeds, um, and, and really nailing that and ultimately just being able to bang out part after part because it's ultimately a faster process. So I guess what we're trying to describe here is, you know, play around with your process, try, try a couple, try a whole bunch. There's no right or wrong way to make your product if you're selling things. So a constant reiteration of your jigs and your strategy will always help. Um, yeah, that's that's really it. Just constant reiteration and tweaking. And uh, I guess that gets me on to my next thing here. Um, something I was talking with Kevin about a little earlier today was, you know, he was mentioning it takes about three, right? So three iterations of a project to, you know, get to a point of either you're happy with it and it's perfect, or you're at a place where you're like, okay, this is you know, workable. And, you know, does that mean totally throwing it away and starting again and doing it better? No. Um, oftentimes, as I'm machining, I'm looking over at Chipoko, I'm looking at what it's cutting, I'm thinking, oh, well, I didn't really like that feature. So while my machine is cutting, I open up Carb I Create. I'm already creating, you know, the the next iteration of it. I can pause that cut. I can start a new one. It's just thinking ahead adds to, you know, okay, this is generally going pretty well. What can I change in my workflow? What can I change in my design? Can I add a chamfer here to look better? There, there's constant room to readjust and 
I think a big thing to get away from mentally is that this design looks perfect in Carbide Create. It's going to run perfectly and I'm going to get it in one go. That's There's no way. And if there is, tell me who you are. I'd love to meet you. <laughs> that's 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 awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, you know, being able to know when to make a change or, you know, just constantly thinking about your project in different ways is really helpful. Um, also, another thing I was talking with Kevin about is knowing when to just quit. There are things that I've tried to cut and I just... You know, either it's the design isn't working, the design just looks bad or, or what have you. And, you know, just start over, surface that piece of wood, create something new, you know, start again. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to go over a couple of things that, you know, we hear in support in terms of, you know, speed and efficiency and, and you know, what those look like, uh, you know, on the machine. One thing that I wanted to talk about in, in you know, the webinar is Carbide Motion 6. We actually have a beta for it out right now. It is a really big update to Carbide Motion in general. And it's honestly been pretty interesting and, and a very good step forward moving forward. So if you're watching this and you're curious, uh, you can find it over on our Carbide Motion beta page. And I think it's worth checking out. Thank you for taking the time and watching this with us. If you have any, you know, suggestions for future topics, please add them in the comment section of our YouTube video, or you can reply directly to the Carbide Community Forum post, and we'll be happy to touch on that in the next one. Just have a great rest of your day.